Thompson back in action talking all things Texas A&M. And while we're going to break down, of course, the big time bowl victory for the Aggies over the weekend against the likes of North Carolina, the state of Texas has gotten a little bit more interesting with the new hiring of a Texas head coach. How will that affect the SEC? How will that affect uh, A&M in their recruiting process? How will all of that work out? We'll be discussing all that to begin today's show. This episode of Locked on Aggies is brought to you by Built Bar, where a candy bar meets a protein bar. Go visit BuiltBar.com and use the promo code Locked On to save 20% off your next purchase. That promo code is Locked On at BuiltBar.com. So for any of you who do not know me here on WFAA.com, I am Cole Thompson, and I do cover Texas A&M for Locked on Aggies. I know all about Texas A&M, what you need to be following, who are some recruits that are coming in, all the up-to-date information, and with my background in, of course, the NFL realm, we also talk a little bit more about the NFL side of Aggies as well, keeping you up to date with what's going on. So to do any of that, make sure you're following us on social media at Mr. Cole Thompson. I am the host of the show, and I love public feedback. Anything you can do to help make this a more quality-sounding podcast, give me a follow, give me a shout-out, put it in the repertoire, and I will add it into the mix on a weekly basis. Secondly, Locked on Aggies. Locked on Aggies is your number one source for all things 12th May related content found here on LOP. You can subscribe on iTunes, listen on Spotify if you can't do any of that, listen live every single day at LockedOnPodcast.com. So for Texas A&M, big time game this past weekend. Great fourth quarter, great showing of what the future holds for guys like, uh, D- you know, uh, guys like uh, Devon Achi, guys like uh, even Isaiah Spiller, Anaya Smith. But there was something that kind of got in the way during the day of that game. The focus was on the game that night, but during the day, there were not a lot of conversations going on about the Fiesta Bowl. There was not a lot of conversations going on about what was happening with other programs. There was about one program and one program alone, and that is, of course, a announced biggest rival of all time, Texas. Texas announced that they would be firing Tom Herman after he struggled to become the actual leader of the Longhorns. He went 32-18 and 18 at UT, finished the season off with a big-time win over Colorado in the uh, Valero Alamo Bowl, but he never won the Big 12 championship. Hours after the firing of Herman, it was announced that Alabama offense coordinator Steve Sarkeesian would be the next head coach for the Longhorns. While people are sitting here and wondering, well, what does that mean? It just means that the Big 12 got a Saban assistant who has background knowledge of not just the NFL, but what it takes to make it at the NFL level, and has a guy who can now pluck from the SEC to bring Texas back to relevancy. Now, whoever you want to look at it, Sarkeesian is always going to come with a little bit of a background problem. He won the Burroughs Award this past year for the top assistant in the FBS program, but he made a commitment to Saban that he would stay with the team during the national program, uh, national championship program uh, presented by AT&T against number three Ohio State this upcoming Monday. That'd be next week. However, he said it would be a little typical juggling duties of how to prepare for Actual National Signing Day, trying to get kids to you know stay with the program after they've already committed, uh, but haven't verbally signed on the dotted line, making sure that players understand, I am here, I'm going to try to make things work with you. Uh, and then, of course, you know, trying to prepare for an actual national championship. Sarkeesian, who's making $2.5 million a year as Saban's assistant, declined an interview with Auburn. And at that point, a lot of people thought, okay, this is now the hiring for Nick Saban when he retires. But a program like Texas, a blue blood, something that a lot of people have said we want back to relevancy, just it's too hard to pass up. And when you look at what Tom Herman did over the past few seasons, you know, he finished six and three. He had a seven and three when they finished at the year, but they probably could have been eight and three with the bowl game. It just goes back to kind of a very similar thing with Gus Malzahn. And Malzahn in Alabama was you have to win as many games as possible to contend with the likes of the Crimson Tide. And the last three years, it felt like it was Ed Orgeron and Jimbo Fisher. And for a little bit, Dan Mullen, before he went to the East, that were right there with Bama. It wasn't Auburn. Auburn would get a win over Alabama at the, you know, at the end of the year, but 
that was more so playing an upset to them, not contending along with them, which and where the problem lies. Texas is very similar with Tom Herman. You beat your rival in Oklahoma, which he did. He did beat Oklahoma in the Cotton Bowl once. He also lost a lot of easy games on late drives multiple times. He had one winning season of 10 plus wins in the last decade. That's how many wins Texas had in the last decade. One. And it was two years ago when they played in the Sugar Bowl. And then Sam Ellinger said, we're back. And they weren't back. They weren't even close to being back. They were so far from being back that now it is a common joke whenever people say Texas is back because of they're not at that level. Herman is not a bad coach. Herman's actually a very good coach. And a lot of people, I think, out there would agree that Herman at a smaller program like the University of Houston works. Like, I would say, maybe a Iowa State would work. Uh, even Nebraska right now would work. But Texas is going through a phase where they're not only losing in the Big 12, they're losing recruits to teams in the Big 12. And they're losing recruits in the state of Texas to their rival in the SEC and a and And they're losing recruits to the SEC in general with guys like, uh, I forget his name, but he was a four-star quarterback from Fort Ben Marshall who turned on UT to go to Missouri. And then there's multiple receivers who go to Alabama and go to Florida, and go to Georgia, and leave the state. They don't stay. And that's why Texas, as a recruiting class, has hurt the last few years. Don't get me wrong, they're not bad. You know, a top 15 finish is very good, but not at Texas's level. And Chris Del Conte, the Texas, A&M Athletic, uh, Texas Athletic Director, came out and said, I actually want to give Herman a shot, but we have this opportunity to try and build up something that we really love. We wish Herman nothing but the best. And I get it. Herman's done his part to be good. But when you look at what a guy like Sarkeesian can bring, it adds a little bit more to the table. And that's very similar to what had happened with Malzahn. Malzahn and Herman kind of are neck and neck intertwined together, if that makes any sense. One is definitely proven that they can be a head coach at a high-level program One has proven he can be a head coach at a smaller program and get them high-end results. That's the difference between the two. But now Sarkeesian will come into uh, Austin and will probably help win in recruiting. The thing is, how does this affect A&M? In my opinion, it doesn't. Jimbo Fisher and the recruiting trail that he has built from College Station has really solidified what this team can be in a few years. I mean, they have another top 10 recruiting class and they're continually winning the state. I think Sarkeesian, a West Coast guy, a guy who comes from starting his career off, you know, as a big time name at USC and then getting the head coaching job at Washington, turning Washington around and then going back to USC as the head coach. Sarkeesian's going to go pluck talent from California. And everyone who knows around Texas, we all talk about it. I mean, everyone does. Austin is slowly turning into the next Silicon Valley. You're going to be able to get more recruits coming from California to Texas because Austin's very similar to the style that's brought out there. That's where A&M struggles, is getting kids on the West Coast. And A&M just finished 9-1 and with kids from the Heartlands, kids from Illinois, Kids from Nebraska, kids from uh, Arkansas, kids from, uh, you know, t- uh, Missouri, Texas, Florida, like southern parts of Florida. They're winning in those areas. So for me, as a fan of college football in general, I love when teams that are supposed to be good are good. Sarkeesian is a definite strange hire for the sheer fact of you have no idea what he will bring to the table. But on the flip side, what Sark can do is he can add another element that Alabama had. Keep in mind, Tua Tungavailoa stayed at Alabama because he wanted to work with Sarkeesian. Him and Sarkeesian worked out. They had a heck of a year last year. He transformed Mac Jones into a contender. They already look like they have a quarterback in place in Colin Thompson. So one big part of the analogy is already out. I think Sark can do a very good job bringing kind of that West Coast-style offense over 
to the likes of Austin, Texas. But I don't think it's really going to affect AM. I think the most it's going to do is you're going to see a couple of recruits that are leaning one way or another don't lean anymore. They literally just take the next step and jump to one side or the other. This episode of Locked on Aggies is brought to you by betonline.ag. Listen, the college football playoff is coming to a close. We have the national championship coming up, but you also have the NFL playoffs coming around. That means that with the regular season done, it's time to make those bets, and the one place that we trust is betonline.ag. They give you the top NFL games, the top NFL lines, plus the top college football and basketball lines for long-term or short-term bets. Don't sit on the sidelines anymore. Get in the action and use the promo code Locked On to get a 50% welcome bonus with your first deposit. Visit our good friends and exclusive partners at betonline.ag to take advantage of the best bonuses in the business. Sign up for a pre-account and use the promo code LockedOn.ag for your first purchase. Locked On, uh, betonline.ag, your Locked On podcast experts. Locked on Aggies presented by the Locked on Podcast Network. Cole Thompson back in action talking all things Texas A&M. Guys, as I mentioned on the show, you have a great shot to begin 2020 off on the right note. My bad, 2020 is over. 2021 is about to start. So why don't you do so by winning some money with betonline.ag. Featured by your uh, uh, featured by your boys, uh, your boy Q and Lee Sterling of Paramount Sports. They are picking basketball, college football, and NBA locks all winter long. Subscribe to the new show, Locked on Bets, wherever you get your podcast listening systems. All right, so we're done talking about Sarkeesian. Uh, real fast, I'm going to say this. Alabama loses another offense coordinator. This lessens the gap for a and I really think when you listen to the reports that have come out as of today, it's not a good sign of what is to come. The top two names on the list right now, according to sources, are Bill O'Brien, former head coach at uh, Houston Texans and Penn State, or Adam Gase, the former Miami Dolphins head coach, former Broncos, uh, you know, Bears offense coordinator, former Jets head coach who went 9-23 and in two years. Neither of that looks good. What looks good is what A&M is bringing to the table. When you watch that game, you have to break it down quarter by quarter. And throughout the game, there was moments where it looked like a and struggled. Now, Sam Howell did have a good game. He showed off his mechanics. He showed off his arm. He showed off his footwork. He showed off why people are enamored by him and why potentially he could be the number one overall pick in 2022, maybe 2023. However, you look at how the team is built and how a and is going to be successful in the next few years. I was really impressed with the young talent. That's something that a lot of people are not going to be talking about because of it's the Kellen Mond show. It's the Kellen Mond show. Kellen Mond gets the big win. Kellen Mond, you know, he gets his New Year's Six win. And that's great. And Kellen Mond still could return. There's no guarantee that he is immediately headed towards the NFL. But let's look at the young talent and how they played. Antonio Johnson played that nickel position and had one bad play that was not a bad play. It was actually a really good play in man coverage and just an even better play by Daz Newsom in the end zone. Overall, I think he had nine total tackles. He had a critical fourth down stop along with Buddy Johnson, and he stepped up in a big way as the next name to watch for in coverage. I think that there's really going to be a you know decision to be made. Do you play him at safety next year? Do you play him in the nickel? Do you play him... Uh, do you play him in only dime formations? He made some names for himself. And he did a great job. Andre White Jr. Aaron Hansford did not have a big time day. In fact, he was very limited overall when you think about it. White had a key interception in the first quarter that helped set up AM for their first touchdown with Isaiah Spiller. That is a big time get if Buddy Johnson goes to the NFL draft, which is possible because of, again, every player has an opportunity to come back next year or they can go. If Buddy Johnson goes, guess who's the leading guy? It's Andre White. Jalen Jones, good day in coverage. He allowed a touchdown, but same time, it was one of those trick plays that everyone falls for. It was a, it was a freshman mistake. But overall, you can't really flaunt him on anything else. McKinley Jackson, great job bull rushing on third down. 
He's a third down pass rusher, and he did a great job adding Howell duress. There's a lot of things that he did right. So that's four playmakers who will be either juniors or sophomores next year. That's not including DeMarvin Leal, who had a great game as well. That's not including Tyree Johnson, who could return. That's not including Jaden Peavy, who has already said, I will return. That's not including um, Damani Richardson. That's not including Devin Morris, who was out this game with a concussion. AM's defense is really good. And that's why they ranked in the top 12 this year. They ranked 11th overall with Mike Oko. They were the third run defense, and they showed why. I wonder how this game would have paired out if three of the top offensive players for uh, North Carolina were playing. I'm not sure it would have been so you know perfectly even, but I can tell you this much. A&M's defense showed that they can go pound for pound with anybody. Sam Howell is a really good quarterback. In fact, he's better than a lot of other SEC quarterbacks. Defensively, A&M has set themselves up to be built for the long haul. And they have a lot of young talent that hasn't received a lot of respect this year because of how much veteran talent is there. And they're not losing much, you know, defensively. I mean, they're not losing much defensively overall. They're actually keeping a lot of defensive players. They're... You know, they're only potentially going to say goodbye to four guys. And two, one of them is kind of a rotational player in Keldrick Harper. One of them is a cornerback in Miles Jones. They have a good up-and-coming guy in Joshua Moten, I think. I think you could play Devin Morris on the outside. Brian George, he was a junior corner, a junior college corner. He came over. He had two interceptions in the final game of the season against Tennessee. This is not a bad spot to be in if you're Mike Elko. And this is not a bad spot to be in if you're AM either. Because AM, now all they have to do is just continue to play the ball that they know that they can do. And as long as that happens, they're set up for immense success. Offensively, there's some things you got to work on, of course. But defensively, they're in for the long haul. This episode of Locked on Aggies is brought to you by Bill Bar. Now, you know the Bill Bar code of the past 12 original flavors, including double chocolate, salted caramel, mint brownie, and banana bread. Now there's six new flavors, including uh, and not excluding carrot cake, lemon almond cheesecake, cherry bakia, and cookies and cream that will make a delicious treat. Built Bars are more like candy bars than they are protein bars because they're covered in 100% real chocolate and they're soft and easy to chew. Plus, they're great for someone who is a health-conscious guy like myself because I can lose or maintain weight while indulging in a delicious treat. The bars are low in calorie, they're low in sugar, they're high in protein, high in fiber, and great for someone on the keto diet. Literally, every single morning before I start my day, I go and work out. I always start off with the peanut butter brownie bar. It's got 19 grams of protein, 180 calories, 5 grams of sugar, 5 grams of net carbs. You're not going to find a product like this anywhere else out on the shelves. And when you visit BuiltBar.com, use the promo code Locked On to save 20% off your first purchase. Locked On promo code Use it to get 20% off your first purchase. It's a new year. It's a new you. Go ahead and start it off right with a delicious treat, Built Bar, from BuiltBar.com. Locked on Aggies, presented by the Locked On Podcast Network. Cole Thompson back in action, talking all things Texas A&M. Guys, I'm going to tell you about this. The upcoming week is going to be a lot of features on what the future of A&M looks like. Now, we're going to be breaking this down Week in and week out, offense, running backs, you know, wide receivers, every position kind of going this way. So make sure you tune in all week long when we talk and break down everything you need to know about the future of Texas A&M. Subscribe wherever you get your Locked On podcast listening systems. So let's talk about this for one second. Kellen Mon, gotta give him credit. He got the big win. Was it impressive? Oh, at times it was. He had several great throws. The team did a good job moving the ball in the second half. But at the end of the day, it goes back to what I was talking about way at the start of the season that makes AM so dangerous for the future. That's a run game. Without Devon Ache, um, uh, Ache, I mean, however you say it, I mean, literally he changes it every day. It's A-Chain on one way, it's A-Chain on another. Without A-Chain, does a win that game? I don't think so. Two big runs at the fourth quarter, including the 78-yard run, shows 
what the potential is for him as a lead back. This was a kid who came out of high school. They didn't really know where to play him. I mean, literally, if you ask a bunch of recruiting scouts where he's playing, one, I think, want him to play safety. One, want him to play quarterback. One, wanted him to play wide receiver. One said, we're just going to use him as a gadget player. A&M said, we're going to use him as a running back. A&M is walking away with a 9-1 and season uh, because of that reason. That's why. Pure speed. Pure agility. What he can do. But what's awesome about that play is he's a freshman who came in for Isaiah Spiller because Isaiah Spiller was hurt in the fourth quarter with an ankle injury. And he had been kind of banged up all season. He rushed for a thousand yards. Good on him. Finished third in the SEC in rushing. But he comes in, freshman, you know, every job is replaceable in college football. One play and you start getting more reps. Another play after that, you start getting more reps. But it didn't matter. A&M's offensive line was blocking for him like crazy. His wide receiver, Chase Lane, Got a great block on the outside on the Tar Heel corner. Jalen Weidemeyer cut back in last second to hit a linebacker, keep him off him, and that was off to the races. A couple plays earlier than that, Anaya Smith, gadget player, true gadget player. I'm not going to call him a wide receiver. I'm not going to call him a wide receiver. I'm not going to call him a a running back because he's not. He's neither. He's a gadget guy who works in so many different ways for A&M. Made five defenders miss, I think it was, to set up for the Kalamon touchdown that he rushed in. That alone shows the potential of AM. And you also have Isaiah Spiller, who again was hurt the entire fourth quarter, bullied his way twice in the end zone. Good game for him. AM has the pieces all over the field to be really good. But that running back group, that trio of players is so essential to team success this season and next season that that's what you have to trust. If Smith is better at a wide receiver, run jet sweeps with him if you want to play running back. If A-Chain can offer something more in the running game, run a double, you know, run a pistol set. Have Spiller and A-Chain line up across from each other, and whoever has the edge, option it. Find ways to get all three of those players involved because those three are the most dangerous three on your team. Jalen Weidemeyer did not have a great game, but Kellerman really didn't target him. Chase Lane, slowly showing up as a number one receiver. Hezekiah Jones, I like him better as kind of a you know middle-of-the-pack guy. I want to see Demond Demas. Praying to God he does not transfer because if he is a number one and Caleb Chapman, who got hurt last year in week three, imagine him back. Whoever's playing quarterback next year, King, Calzada, uh, Stowers, Kellen Mond himself, if he wants to come back. If the offensive line can be replaced, because unfortunately that is something that we have to look at. The offensive line, there's going to be uh, there's going to be players who leave. There's going to be players who are done. There's going to be players who have to you know who have to go. If they can be fixed, find the weakness. Find the weakness on this team. In the starting rules, there really isn't any. Wide receiver is weak. Another year in the system hopefully builds off that. Quarterback. You have three incredible options, two bonkers options to be your next guy, replacing Kellen Mond. A tight end that is so dangerous could be the next Kyle Pitts. And a defense that is returning seven full-time starters, three part-time starters, and potentially the entire starting lineup if the players don't leave. There's not a weakness. And as I said, Alabama is losing Steve Sarkeesian. Is that going to hurt A&M in the recruiting game? Like that much. Is that going to hurt Alabama in the recruiting game? Like that much. Is that going to hurt Alabama's production? Like that much. Is that going to help A&M's production? Like that much. For those of you who don't see, who are just listening to the podcast, I'm like way out of the screen. That's how much it helps A&M. 
They set themselves up for a very good game. And we'll be breaking down this game a lot more the rest of the week, talking about what we can expect from the future. But that's going to do for this edition of Locked on Aggies. Make sure you're following us on social media at Mr. Cole Thompson and at Locked on Aggies. Subscribe wherever you get your podcast listening systems. Tomorrow's show, we'll be talking about Kellen Mond's legacy, and we'll be talking about the potential of what could happen next with the AM quarterbacks. We'll see you then. And remember, get good, y'all.